jeepers you're listening to smash or pass hi everyone welcome to another video on the jv hello and millie channel today as always we're joined by rihanna hi we're also really exci excited to be able to be speaking with devon hi and we also have the absolute pleasure of being joined by paul scheffler today hello <laughs> so we're really excited to be speaking with Paul because we absolutely love their work from the roles of Cats and the Quack in Courage which of course were brought back recently in Straight Out of Nowhere and that's something as well we're really excited to be speaking about so JB I know you had the first question I think yeah that's absolutely amazing so kind of an introduction to your career we can see that you are acting credits dating all the way back until 1989 i believe and you continue to have some exciting projects coming out more recently so what kind of sparked this love for actor <laughs> i think it was 1989 years ago. uh what <laughs> made me want to become an actor um uh i didn't know what the hell i wanted to be uh to be honest with you i was 19 years old and and i was in that crisis point of what do I want to do with my life? And I happened to be in California at a two-year college. I had was going to go to Berkeley to get a degree in English because I, I thought I could write, and I'm, I do write now, but I was it, my heart wasn't really in it, so I was desperately looking for something else to do, and I happened to be at a two-year college that had a phenomenal theater program uh, where Robin Williams uh, went to school. And so there was this legacy to this place and there was all this money for the arts in schools, can you imagine? Because um, it just doesn't exist anymore. So I just threw myself into the drama program and I just fell instantly in love with it and, and realized that 1920 I was a little behind the curve so uh, I just taught myself to sing and I just I, I just threw myself into it fully and I, I ended up going to train in Carnegie Mellon University um, and then went to New York after that and struggled for three or four years until things started to happen but uh, I knew my heart was in it and so those two big questions what do you want to do with your life and then how do you do it we're we're front and center for me and um i just had a passion for it so that's mm -hmm. how it ended up happening but i was just going what am i gonna do you know i had no idea so that's so how it's so something we came across that really you know we all really enjoyed was when you were mentioning your love for walnut street theater mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about that please well, the Walnut Street Theater is the oldest um, professional theater in the United States, in Philadelphia. It is uh, renowned historically, and it's a wonderful place. And uh, I have had the good fortune to work there about 14 times. They've offered me wonderful roles, uh, and I have a great relationship with them, and I respect their history, and they um, just were very generous with me and the stuff that they gave me to do. And so, um, and I've, I've had a, a couple of theaters. Another one was out in California where I just had the opportunity. They just kept asking me to come out and do stuff, often with very little rehearsal. And so there's this... <clears throat> terror that you experience when you've never done anything before and if it's a large role you don't know you can do it until you're doing it and it's terrifying uh and so i, I had these great opportunities at, at walnut street and um other places and so i have a great deal of gratitude and appreciation for the chances that they gave me because you know you don't get that kind of thing very often in new york Unless you're extremely lucky and there are people who do but for most of us you're just looking for work anywhere and oh by the way it's a great compliment when people ask you to come back and work again and again and again so that there's a very um it gives you a lot of confidence because you feel like you're doing good work and they appreciate it and you're trying to make their job easier you know if you go in and prepared and you're doing all this stuff and it makes everybody else's job easier so it was just a a, a nice thing to to reinforce uh, that I was on the right track until Absolutely. I got older and then I'm just miserable with everybody and I just, you know. So given your love for performing, was there anyone in the, the film or theater industry that you looked up to um, before com becoming an actor? Oh, you know, since I grew up in England, I, I, I had an enormous love and respect for all the greats. Like, I don't know if you guys remember Laurence Olivier, but <clears throat> um, all those great actors. And I saw a lot of them. I used to go to theater all the time and I was just 
blown away by their talent and as a marker for something to aim for. Um, not that you're necessarily going to get there because these are people <clears throat> in some other stratosphere, but that kind of work really was inspiring. Uh, so, God, you know, so many of the great original British actors and along the way, just I have so many favorite actors that I could go on and on about American British that, uh, you know, the Ian McKellens, the <clears throat> John Hurts, the uh, uh, Richard Harris, um, uh, just slews of, 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 of people that I, I admire and watch. And how do they do that? You know, how, wow, God, you know, it's just, <clears throat> they just look like they, they live in it, you know? <clears throat> so whenever you see that, it's just inspiring. Well, I'll, there's two, two, I have two reactions to that. One, because I'm a singer as well, right? And I've, I've trained my whole life to sing. Uh, in addition, and, and I have another friend and I, we j joke about this because there are people, I don't know, do you know Billy Porter? You've heard of Billy Porter, okay? Well, I know Billy Porter, and he's an amazing singer, and he grew up doing gospel. And there, and there's another few people that I know who are just singing maniacs. They just walk, they talk, they sing, they open their mouth, and they just make this glorious sound and make it sound effortless. And it's not that way for most people. And so, <laughs> the simultaneous reaction is. Well, if I can't do that, I'm taking my toys and I'm going home because, well, you know, why would you aim for anything less than that, right? While at the same time, you're being inspired by them going, God, that's amazing. I would love to be able to do that. And I think there are actors like the Benedict Cumberbatch is another one. I just love watching him work. I mean, you know, there's so many amazing people out there. So, yeah. So. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, all, yeah. And, you know, we're all such a huge fan of your work and we believe that you've done both voiceover work and on screen work yeah. um, how does it one differ from the other preparation wise and do you have one which you prefer doing over the other um boy it depends on what you're doing because both can be really joyous and fun and the others can be really challenging and difficult and you always want to do your best um i've done a lot more animation work a lot more voice work than i've done on screen work i'll tell you that doing on screen work um often is very fast and you have to <clears throat> know your stuff and and I don't know honestly people who do the regulars and have a large amount of material to learn weekly or daily sometimes um, it's extraordinary how much they have to assimilate and memorize and just go because you don't have time and when you're working on screen time is money so you are under the gun constantly. Um, <clears throat> I did a person of interest uh, recently and, and uh, it was a complicated scene and the director is just like, okay, no, no, you, you're going too slow. You've got you to speak faster, got to speak faster. It's like, okay, okay. So you're feeling tense when you're still trying to, you know, bring life to what you're doing. So I, 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 these people who do this, I admire the hell out of them because that is just so much pressure. It's wonderful to be able to do it, but uh, you don't have that. In, in voiceover work. I mean, especially if you're doing cartoons and animation, they give you a lot more latitude to play and to come in in your pajamas if you feel like it, you know, cause you're not on screen. So <clears throat> they want you to come in if you relax and have a really good time. And so you're not under that gun, um, but both can be rewarding depending on what you're doing. Yeah. Well, oh, thank you so much for that. And I suppose speaking more about your animation work, just to switch up the scene a bit, of mm -hmm. course, a main reason why we reached out to you is because I think it's fair to say that we all absolutely adore your work, Encourage the Cowardly Dog. It's absolutely mm -hmm. iconic. You've done so much. So I guess going right back to the start of your journey with Courage, when did you first hear about that show? I just got asked to go into an audition for it. I didn't know what it was. I, I had no clue about what it was, as you often don't with these things. And they handed me a picture <clears throat> of, of cats. And, and they said, well, they're looking for voices. Um, and I just had this idea when I was looking at it that, boy, this looks like, you know, maybe I should, do you guys know who James Mason is? He's an old British actor. He did, um, oh, uh, what's the film with Judy Garland? A Star is Born, the very first A Star is Born. 
And he actually talked like this, you know, he had this sort of voice that was very much like this and very sort of sophisticated and just sort of, you know, quiet, but, but absolutely silky smooth. And I thought, I'm going to do that. And it landed. <clears throat> John Dilworth heard it and went, oh, that's the voice. And so that's how I got in to, to Courage the Cowardly Dog. And so um, all the other characters... I was just goofing around in the studio. <clears throat> I was coming up with voices and doing accents and doing French or whatever, I, whatever I'm thinking about. And he was like, oh my God, you do all these different things and what else can you do? And so I was just playing, 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 playing. And so how all of that other stuff happened was that he would come up and say, here's this French duck. Do you think you could come up with a voice <laughs> for that? Go away for a couple of days and then, and then see what you can come back with. And so the way this works, is that <clears throat> you have to go away and look at it, the picture, they give you a drawing of it, and then um, come up with not just one voice, but as many voices as you can think of. Because what happens is you go back into the studio <clears throat> and they say, okay, let's hear what you got. And you start with something and they go, no, that's not right. Uh, what else you got? And then you try another one and they go, nah, it's closer, but that's not quite right. So you spend a lot of time <clears throat> with the producer and John, the creator, going around and around in circles about where you land. And then they'll suddenly go, that, that's the voice, that's the voice. And so <clears throat> that's often how it happens. And he probably doesn't remember this, but a lot of times the first thing that you did, you go all the way back around and you end up close to that. So <laughs> the first thing they say no to, they come back up, you know, that's the voice. And I said, well, that's what I was doing to begin with. But um, so a lot of times that would happen. Uh, and but that was really fun. But you have to come up with a lot of different different voices, and um, that's happened. That happened for Bug Diaries. I did I did Amazon series for Bug Diaries, <laughs> and they wanted a voice for a walking stick. I was like, okay, what the hell does that sound like? And so I came up with this thing where you know I, I tried all these different things, and they landed on something like that. But you literally have to contort your voice in all these different ways and hope that they like one of them because often they don't. Um, but it uh, it sure was fun to do. It was a lot of pressure, but but it was it was just so much fun to do. And it was a time when I was doing um, <clears throat> I was doing Hook and Peter Pan on Broadway. And so I would come in and my voice was just feeling great because I was doing all the singing and yelling and it was all very flexible. And so I, I had this malleability with it at that time that uh, enabled me to try all these different things. And so, um, so they just kept throwing things at me. And one day I did, by the way, I did, I did a Sean Connery like this. I said, well, you know, I think you should, he said, you're doing Sean Connery? I did, yes, I am. I've done a lot of... Uh, you know, spy movies, and I like to do animation as well. And he said, oh, I have to write a character that. So he actually wrote a character, The Snowman, well, from me just goofing around in the studio. So, you know, it was just like falling into a pot of jam, to be honest with you, because these, these sort of jobs do not come along very often. And to have a, a, a symbiotic uh, relationship that John and I had, um, John Dilworth, was great because he just <clears throat> threw a lot of stuff at me, and um, we did a lot of playing. And he's a brilliant brilliant crazy guy um and that card the courage is a very as you know very dark dark um darkly animated series and uh but very clever and so i'm sorry i'm long-winded and i apologize for that no that's absolutely perfect <laughs> and of course thank you so it. much for <laughs> that kind of cat's voice there because that's something that i absolutely love and you mentioned that cats was the kind of main pitch you know you were given the cats photo and asked to come mm -hmm. up with a voice for cats but were there any other characters at that initial stage that you were asked to try a voice for or did it all stem from that cats character that you <laughs> everything stemmed from that that cats character and then he heard me goofing around in the studio and he thought oh well oh god maybe we should get paul this maybe we should get paul that and that's mm -hmm. just how it happened and honestly, there were a couple that I couldn't make work, but I ended up doing about 12 different characters in it. There was some that you probably don't know, like the <clears throat> these two zombie guys who everyone wants to direct. And I don't My know favorite they, episode. They like that one. So I was yeah. one of the zombies. And, and that was just horrifying on the voice. But you had to sound dead. And they kept saying to me, you're not sounding dead enough, Paul. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so I literally had blood coming from my cords. Oh, no. 
I did. So yeah, because sometimes you walk out of there and you'd be like absolutely shredded vocally, but that was, that was for sure one of them. And I remember it. Um, so, so yeah, it was just, I was just lucky enough to, to, um, to just have been handed a whole lot of stuff that was, um, including the, uh, the, uh, the TV announcer at the top, which is <clears throat> just very different than everybody else. He's just a guy on too much coffee. Um, <laughs> It really is amazing just hearing how you can alter your voice so quickly without any like kind of preparation. The voice just it's there. And that's so impressive to see. Um, do you remember, you know, when like you found out that, you know, you're going to voice cats, how long it was before you started going into the recordings? And also, did your approach differ like from the fact you were in there from the first episode as opposed to if you were joining like an animated series, say halfway through? Um... I didn't know what to expect. It was my first animation gig. Uh, I think it was about two weeks. I think I was scared shitless. Um, and I went in just not knowing what to expect and just trying to stay calm and, and, and go with it. Um, and, uh, and it just went, it went really well because that voice, I, so here's the thing, once they, once they hear a voice that they like, then you just have to go back to that and find different ways of expressing a sentence or saying something, but it's still in that voice, right? So once you, that, that's the one thing that I've learned when you do a voiceover or an audition for an animated thing, once you, they hear the voice, you just gotta repeat that. That's all, that's all it is. So 90% of the work is, is done, but I was very nervous. And <clears throat> I didn't also realize, and I'm sure there, I've had the conversation with like people who do animation, but I would have to take a towel into the studio with me because it is so physical. Animated characters are so all over the place. And the more you physicalize what you're doing, the more life you're bringing to what you're doing. So you have to be really physical with it in order to bring the kind of life to it that it needs. And you just come out absolutely drenched in, in sweat. Um, <clears throat> so <laughs> it's not like reading the news, you know, it really isn't. Because these characters are so larger than life, right? Um, and you have to be larger than life. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> And like you said, there were so many of these characters as well that you were voicing from Freaky Fred to Cats. Um, and like you're saying as well, the animation for Courage actually can be quite dark. And as for some people, this was the foundation of them beginning to like horror movies and all that kind of thing. When you no. were voicing those, did you know that you were kind of setting that foundation and that affected the voice or... Was it just it all transpired and just was just a huge success? No, I didn't. I, I didn't think along those lines at all. I was just thinking about trying to bring the character to life and how they did it was really up to them. But when I started to see the episodes, I was like, oh, my God, this is so dark, you know. Um, and that's probably when I and I didn't remember. I don't think I saw um, any episode until halfway through the first season. And then, then you get to see it. You're going, that's the first time I saw it. I'm like, oh, oh, okay, we're going there, are we? Um, so uh, to answer your question, I had no idea. I had no idea what it was going to be until I saw it. Uh, but they knew what they were about. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so super simple question. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite character that you voiced on the show? Um, I don't know why I have such an affinity for for. La Quack. I loved Freaky Fred and I wish they had done more of that because it was such a standalone character and so out there and weird and dark and, and even when I did it I was like are kids, kids going to respond to this? <laughs> um, but I love doing the cats because, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, you know who else? I, uh, the Cajun Fox was a lot of fun too. Um, but La Quack, I don't know. They just did this whole thing with, <laughs> you know, that whole thing. It was just fun to do. And a lot of times you you came I came up with ideas that they wrote into it. Um, they said, "Oh, do that. We'll add that to to it." So it, it, there was a lot of opportunity to to play, and that's ultimately what it is. It's just you're you're being a kid and you're making these voices, even though you're a grown man acting like a. 10 year old um that's what it is. <laughs> and did, did, you, did you ever have any trouble making the voices like like figuring out their distinct voices for each character i know you already discussed kind of figuring out the voices but was it ever difficult to make sure they are all distinct in their very own unique like character 
Some, yes. Some, most of them came pretty easily. The ones that uh, were a little um, off. I mean, you, you guys mentioned Dr. Vindaloo and would that fly today because of, you know, how our sensibilities are a little different. But I honestly, I was just, I was in the booth going, well, I don't know about this, but we should maybe try to do a little bit. And then he said, oh, well, I'm going to write a character for that. That's how that happened. And so I wasn't thinking about whether it was politically correct or not. I, I don't know. So in answer to that question, it's a good question. And I'm, I'm not sure of the answer to it. Um, uh, everything else, um, there was a goose god that um, was just sort of bombastic, you know, and, and but I, I, I felt I, I wanted to make that a little more specific than what it was, but they were really happy with it. And, 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 and they said, by the way, we want you to, to just sing a song in the middle of it. To, to here's, a, here's some lyrics, make up a song. I went, what? To just sing anything that comes to you. And I went, okay. And just from singing that, I had to join the musicians union. They just suddenly sent me something. I was like, what is this? They said, well, you were singing in this cartoon, so now you got to join this union. I was like, oh, okay. So, um, but uh, that's the only one that I felt like I, I, I wish I could have gotten more specific with it. But I don't even to this day know what that would have been. So to answer your question. <laughs> okay, thank you. I, uh, you touched on this a little bit earlier about like your process of bringing all of the characters to life. But mm -hmm. can you explain a little bit more about what you do like specifically as soon as you get given a character and also like what it feels like to actually bring them to life and give them a voice so, give me the first part of your question again um so the process of bringing all the characters to life and like how it makes you feel to be their voice um oh god it, it, it's just it's just it's it's frustrating if you can't find it because then you're like you don't want to go in there and have them go, no, that's not it. And, and by the way, we had a very tough producer uh, who's no longer with us, a wonderful guy, but he was very demanding. And so when you're reading, you're given a script with all these lines and you're only reading your lines and you're not with anybody else, which is, I know, one of your questions. There were a couple of occasions where that was true. And I do have another story that's fascinating. Um, but <clears throat> he would go... You'd read the line in the way that you'd want to go, no, that's not it. You need to be more this. And you'd read it again and go, well, that time you sounded like you were just had a cup of tea. No, we want you to be more like this. So you start to get a little nervous that you're not giving him what you want. So you have to do it over and over and over again. So you're, you're trusting the producer that they're, they're listening for the life vocally that is going to tell the story. And sometimes that diverges with what's going on in your mind. Like, oh, I have this idea to do it this way. And they go, no, we want it to be more like this. And you're like, oh God. So you have to pivot very quickly and, and listen to what they're saying and try to do that. And they'll go, that's more in the right direction, but try. So they're tuning you constantly like this. And that's you're having fun, but at the same time, you really want to try to get it right for them. And um, sometimes like with LaQuack, it was just like, okay, you know, everything worked great. But other times it's, it's a little harder. So while it is fun, it's a lot of pressure at the same time because they're trying to get it right. And um, all the parts that you see have to, to work together to make something that they see because you're just serving their vision, right? It's their creation and you're trying to give life to it. So <clears throat> you have to go along with, with whatever they're asking you to. Does that answer your question at all? Yeah. It does, thank you. And we got the, we had, we, oh, sorry. <laughs> My buds have just like came out at once. <laughs> right. um, we had the honor of um, interviewing Marty Grabstein quite uh -huh. recently. And he, know, he told us that you often recorded separately, but do you have any stories from times that like the cast of the show like interacted and things like that when recording? Only once, only once, and it was a big crowd scene. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> we had a lot of people in the studio and we're all part of one big crowd. And that's the only time I remember where we had a lot of people. And <clears throat> I've only had one other occasion, which was for a PBS cartoon that was gonna be based on the book, Nate the Great. Do you, remember, do you ever read Nate the Great? Yes. <clears throat> PBS, <clears throat> excuse me, who did Curious George. Right. <clears throat> and Curious George is a little like courage because he doesn't get to speak. He's just got to communicate all of these emotions 
through sound. Um, but in Nate the Great, we, we had a couple of scenes where we were all working together, which is rare. But they canceled the whole thing. <clears throat> we did all of these episodes and it was going to air and the producers got into a fight. And that, that was the end of that. Um, I'll tell you, here's a funny story. Pardon me. I was sharing a dressing room um, <clears throat> on a Broadway show with Wayne Knight, who was the guy who played the, um, the chicken man in Toy Story, right? And I'm so enamored with Pixar, as I'm sure we all are, because they are, you know, the, <clears throat> the apex of, of doing animation. They're so wonderful. And it's so seamless. And I said to Wayne, you know, I said, he said, Wayne, when you were doing Toy Story 2, were you guys all in a booth together recording? Because it sounds so seamless. He said, never. But we were never together. And I was like, that blows my mind because it sounds like you guys are in a room talking to each other. And, and he said, no. And so that's normally the, the way it works. Sometimes they will put you together, but most of the time they don't. They just, they get so many different reads and they cut and paste it so it makes it feel like a conversation that's just happening. It's amazing. It's amazing. Because when you watch stuff in Pixar, you just, you're assuming that people are just together talking to each other in a room. And it's almost not, never the case, as far as my experience is concerned. <laughs> Weird, right? Like you say, it's amazing how well they can bring that together without having to be there and do yeah, that because i know like when we were doing like our watch throughs for scooby watching say the behind the scenes sections of the cyber chase movie seeing them mm -hmm. all there together with like the different microphones and in my mind ever since seeing that i was like okay that must be how all animations are recorded they're all just right. in this line with a director behind mm -hmm. a glass screen but no like to find out that it's completely different is very very interesting Sure. It's, it's, it was a surprise to me. I was expecting to work with other people, uh, especially with stuff that there were long scenes of. No, no, it's crazy. Um, <clears throat> even doing Scooby, you know, I came in and <clears throat> I had a, a very long and hard audition singing a lot before I went in to record for them. And I wasn't feeling great vocally. <laughs> And they said, well, let's just see how it goes. And if it doesn't work, we'll just schedule another time for you to come in. I said, great. They took the pressure off me. It ended up being okay. But um, there, there was a lot of improv in that because at the very end, when they're all doing that stupid dance, they said, improv, whatever you come up with, just so I'm improving as a quack. I'm improving as a cast and coming up with this silly stuff. And they're like, ah, I, don't, I have no idea how much of that made it into the movie. I have no idea. Some of it they took, but the more choices that they have. Oh, well, so I listened to Robin Williams interview and he was talking about Aladdin and he went, well, it's Robin Williams, but he went in and they had a script for him and he went, this is great, but can I, I have some ideas. Can I just improvise? And they were like, well, okay. So four hours later, they took almost everything that he did and put it in, in the because it was so brilliant. But that's Robin Williams, you know. I miss him so much. I miss him so much. Yes, okay. amazing. Anyway, another conversation. <laughs> oh, no, definitely such a, a legend. Um, some of like the final kind of things that they recorded looking back on you, some of the lines, especially in that third night at the museum, you kind of look back on and you're like, oh, that's just terrible. So because he, I went to College of Marin where he went, uh, the director there knew him very well. And of course we talk about him all the time. Everybody talked about Robin because he was just a generational talent. And, and by the way, an extraordinarily generous guy, very into philanthropy and doing wonderful things for people. Um, <clears throat> the director said, if you're one-on-one -on -one with him and you didn't know him and you were sitting at having dinner, normal guy. Just have a normal conversation with him. As soon as a third party arrives, it's an audience. And it's like, it's something switches and he goes off on his routines. But if you were just one-on-one, -on -one, you'd have no idea. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is incredible yeah. learning the behind the scenes of such amazing people, which is, of course, why we love to do these interviews. Like, speaking to you today has been so, so incredible, learning about the different stories, especially because we've got so much love and nostalgia for the projects that you've done and I suppose I guess to dive deeper 
into, I guess, your personal experience around like a show like Courage the Cowardly Dog. Mm-hmm. But do you have any like a favorite moment from recording for the show that springs to your mind? A favorite moment from all of it? Oh man. There was so, you know, there were so many, there was so much laughter. There was so much just joy happening all the time, which is a really good sign, by the way. Um, I just remember, honestly, there being just so many moments of mirth and silliness and laughter. And when it's playful, I, I can't think of anything, one thing off the top of my head, um, honestly. Um, probably if I did, it would be something not good. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, most of my experience, and I'm still friends with all those guys, by the way. And um, it was all just, it was just tremendous fun and, and playfulness. And you have to really take, this sounds paradoxical, but take the play seriously. Mm-hmm. It is play. The more you can go in and just be silly and fun, that's how you, you find things. And they encourage that. And while they were demanding, they were also just like, go and have fun and just play with this. And so it just like felt like being a, 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 a kid in a candy shop. I mean, if I was going to tell you what overall it felt like, it, that's what it felt like. You know, it was very rewarding and fun to do. And, you know, there's a part of you going, God, I don't know if we'll ever, you know, every, every, in our lives, I guess we have these moments where we just feel like we've landed in something fun and cool. And that was definitely one of those moments where you go, well, I just landed here for whatever reason. And it's, it's great. Um, <laughs> yeah i wonder if that's why it did so well that it became so iconic because just speaking to you as we've mentioned we've spoken to marty grabstein earlier every like story that you've both had to tell us about the show just sounded like so much fun and i suppose that kind of passion for the show and the fun that you had working on it probably translated to or like the characters just seeming so vibrant and maybe if the environment was bad or if it didn't blend the show might not have taken off how it did. I agree I agree and 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 they were all pretty unified on the kind of vision that they wanted um so yeah when everything it doesn't matter what project you're doing if the more everybody's on the same page the more likely it is that it's all going to go well um if you're off in different directions then it's going to be hard to pull that together into something that's uh unified and going to come out as something you know really cool um but i guarantee you that you know it doesn't matter if you're watching a series or or a movie you can sometimes just often tell that everything was just together everybody was on the same page and they're all moving in the same direction and a lot of that has to do with the director and the vision that they have for something and they're always trying to keep it in with within that vision even and then you really trust the process when people can articulate it they say we want to do this and this is what we're aiming for so even though you may have done this it's not quite right for what we're looking for and so you start to really get a clearer idea of what they want and the more you do that then it makes the process easier but you know creates creating something like this or a Broadway show or a play or a series is you know, all of those things become exponentially more complicated with more people that are involved. And the more writing there is, is to do. Um, you can imagine how, how hard that is to, to really make work. And so when you do see something great, you know, as you said, you know, when people are really enjoying the process, you can just feel everybody's, you know, on board and fully, in, fully invested in what's happening, right? like anything if you're enjoying doing it you're just you're full on and having a good time at least as in my experience and i wish it would happen more often because sometimes it doesn't happen and then it's like <laughs> it's really hard uh, and i've done plenty of those um unfortunately we all have um so you, when you do come across it it's like thank you thank you you know so um, and I think when you're younger, you're like, oh, well, this is how it's supposed to be. This is going to happen like this all the time. No. no. <laughs> I mean, it definitely seems like it was such a lightning in a bottle effect and that, you know, everything that happened the way it kind of should do. But obviously it could have gone a different way. And you know, something that we spoke about with Marty that was really, really interesting is if they could vo- have voiced a different character from the show or if they were to try their hand at voicing a character, which one would it be? And they said cats and they gave us kind of like a very different but interesting take on the quacks and um, on cats. And so kind of using the Uno reverse card a bit on you, how do you think your interpretation of the character of Courage would have been? 
Well, first of all, I'm going to call Marty and I want to hear on the phone what he did. I want to hear what he did. <laughs> I'm gonna call him and go. Okay, I want to hear this guy. <laughs> I couldn't do. I couldn't do it. Here, his job was so challenging because 97 percent of the time he had to communicate through noises, much like much like uh, um, um, uh, what's his name, Curious George. That guy who had to do that was so good. Because he was communicating all these emotions. So, so and you, I watched that, and I'm, when I'm, my, my kids were younger, and I was like, my God, this guy's so good because he's giving us all these different levels. And so, Marty, of course, his courage is 90% of the time he's freaked out, but you gotta, you can't all be the same. It has to have different. So, I guarantee you, when he was in the booth doing stuff, they were asking him to give all kinds of different levels of that kind of being freaked out. So I, I don't know that I could, could do that. <laughs> He's uh, definitely got the energy for it. <laughs> he, he absolutely, that, that's who he is as a person. Yeah. I'm sure he got that from interviewing him, right? I mean, I hung out with him and he says, he can talk. He'll, he'll talk for 35 minutes straight and just, you know, be that guy. He, he just is that guy. And he was the right person for that role, clearly. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he was incredible as courage and also, like you say, just an amazing people a person to speak with as well. And I guess speaking of interacting with people and talking to people, um, the next question we had for you was, we see that you've done some events like Galaxy Con where you've done signings and like meet and greets and things like that. Do you have a favourite moment or memory from interacting with fans of the show? Um, not one in particular, but I'm always kind of blown away by how uh, people uh, that you meet fans of stuff like this how much they connect with the show and how much it means to them i got a lot of um requests for for me to sign pictures of the characters that i've done and um from kids all over the united states and saying oh this meant so much to me and i just love this character would you be okay to sign your name and send it back in a silver envelope yeah of course absolutely so i guess it's just amazing how how people are affected by different things for whatever reason you know um i received a letter which i still have here for um a live show that i did on broadway and this woman wrote me this long letter talking about how depressed she was and and seeing the show absolutely made her feel so much better and gave her a sense of purpose and i'm like you just never know what's going on with people or how they <clears throat> are affected by something that you do so i can't think of anything any one thing but i i, I just I, I probably everybody who's done the show or any any show phineas for all those guys they're probably amazed by how many people are affected by what they do because you don't get to see that unless you go to these places and and meet people so yeah i mean i guess more on the memories of kind of meeting those people in the signings and things do you remember ever having been asked to sign something that you thought was a bit strange or different? I know <laughs> we've had somebody who had to sign a hamburger, I think. Yeah, Stop. a Big Mac, yeah. we've had a boob, like anything from A to Z, like people have been asked to sign. <laughs> yeah. I, I draw the line of French fries. I, I do. Uh, I... <laughs> no, I haven't had anything quite like that. A, a hamburger? Really? Yeah. yeah. Wow. How does that work? I mean, is it like a moldy hamburger? I mean, because how do you draw on a bun? Because if you start writing it, well, I guess if you had a Sharpie, maybe it would sign, but then it's going to go bad. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a crazy request, right? <laughs> <laughs> Although it was yeah. from McDonald's and those burgers never go off. That's true. That's true. Like, quick, right? you put it on your windowsill and 20 years later, it's exactly the same. Uh, so, <laughs> maybe, I don't know. People are crazy. They're, they're you know... I'm... <laughs> no idea. No idea. <laughs> Seriously. But, um, but the, the takeaway is that you, you, you just don't know how things affect people. Mm. You don't know until you meet them or they talk about it or they write you about something. And you're like, oh, my God, you know, and because you don't you don't think along those lines. But unless you're doing something that's specifically addressing the issues uh, that have to do with what a lot of people are dealing with, then it's something different, but you know, a cartoon and something that's fun and is escapist and all that stuff. You, you don't know, you don't know, but people connect with stuff. They do. But you can't tell. Absolutely. Yeah. And back on the, the topic of like the cons and the conventions and things like that, I'd say that 
at least nowadays, something that gets signed the most, I would say, is Funko Pops. And Courage just got his own Funko Pop, actually. Hello. And you know, <clears throat> Yeah, crazy. And with that, and is there any other characters from the show that you would like to see made into Funko Pops? Maybe some that you could sign, you know? Well, I literally learned what a Funko Pop was about an hour ago because my wife looked it up. I'm like, what's a Funko Pop? I don't know. And I saw the picture. I'm like, oh, okay. I know what these are. Yeah. Oh, I'd take any of them. I mean, I I, I would love Le Quack or Le Cats or, or Freaky Fred or, or Cajun Fox or Snowman or God, there's you know some other ones. But um, yeah, I would love it. I, I, but uh, sure, I, I, any of them. I, don't, I have no particular preference. Sure, why not? If you have a doll... Uh, or <laughs> that's been modeled in something that you've done and you've arrived. You have arrived officially, I think. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> and and with how how courage has affected you were talking about how it affects people's lives and it changes people's lives even in ways that you don't know it. Um, I guess here, you know, what's something that you would say to courage fans that have been with the show since since its beginning? What would I say? Um, <clears throat> thank you for, for being, you know, such great fans. And I don't think we ever thought that the show would have the kind of life that it did. And I just would want to say thank you for their support and, and how much it means to all of us who were part of it and how much we all enjoyed it. I really do. And I'm... Um, John tried to to do a, a pilot of a new series called Before Courage. And I think Marty raved, raised a really good point of it because I did it and he did it and I did different characters, but he did, I think you referenced that in the pages somewhere that he, he did uh, <clears throat> Courage again as Young Courage, but, and it was really a good pilot. It was really good, um, but Cartoon Network, didn't want to go first of all they were going to make a movie out of it and then for some reason it didn't happen that's the way these things go um but marty raised an interesting thing that what can and this is a problem that all series uh confront and that is that people identify the characters as they know them you start introducing a different time or something and that you're you're taking a chance that they're going to go along with that and maybe they were nervous about you know when you're dealing with networks and all the rest of it they're trying to minimize their risk because so much is based on viewership and money and all of that so the more risky it is they don't really want to do it they want to stay in the realm of what they know so i marty raised that point and i thought it was a very good one too so i wonder if that had something to do with it but it's, it was such a good episode too. It was really so. Yeah, you know, it's the way things go. You gotta roll with it. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Yeah. Yeah. Question about that actually. Did so this this episode you're talking about this pilot. Did that make it and did like per, like did it get animated at all or is it just like in the talks? It was all storyboard and we recorded the whole thing. It was all okay. storyboarded and we recorded it, but it never made it to to animation. And I don't know if this is still the case, but they maybe because things are digitalized now, it's so much different. But back when they were doing Courage, they had to, they sent all the animation off to the Far East to do all the drawings and all the stuff, because that's where you could get it made for the least amount of money possible. And then they sent it all back again, because it's so expensive to do that kind of thing. But like everything else, it's changed and things being digital. I don't know. I don't know where things are as far as that end of it is concerned. Um, yeah. I think we're all in agreement that we would have loved to see that episode and if oh. there's any way possible like somehow even just like the voice recordings can be leaked or something I think that would just be enough for us to be happy with. Yeah. <laughs> well in this one I, I played Courage's father. Oh wow. Interesting um, and I, I, I auditioned for some other parts but they, they gave me that I, I was like oh my god this gonna be so much fun and uh, I don't, I, all I, I might have um, storyboards somewhere, but I don't think I have any <clears throat> recordings, unfortunately. I think they, they, they took all of those. <laughs> <laughs> so we're currently in, I'd say, a generation where revivals are constantly popping up, revival series, revival movies. I mean, you know, we've got like, um, I think it's on CW, or I may be mixing up like 
dreaming and stuff, like we've got the revival of Charmed and things like that. If you were asked to return for a Courage the Cowardly Dog revival series, would you do it? Yeah, in a second. Absolutely. I would. <clears throat> I don't know, it may, it may still happen, but I absolutely. I, I would love to do that. Yeah, that's a simple answer, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I love how quick you're just no, like, yeah. I don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to be moving a little bit more on to the Straight Out of Nowhere Scooby Doo meets Courage the Cowardly Dog. Mm -hmm. And when did you first hear the, mm -hmm. the Courage franchise will be making a return? Um, my agent sent me this thing saying that they were going to do the revival and they wanted you to do uh, La Cats and um, La Quack. And then it ended up being the TV announcer on top of that. And um, that was it. I said yes, and they sent over contracts. That was it. They, they wanted me to do it, and it was that simple. Um, we didn't get to negotiate any big fat contracts or anything. Um, uh, it was all scale and so forth, but <clears throat> I, I, yeah, that's how it happened. It was that simple, you know? Some, but it doesn't go that way all the time. <clears throat> sometimes if you're auditioning for something, and they're like, well, we like you, but we want to hear more of this. And sometimes auditions can go on for a longer period of time, but I, 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 the characters were known and I can go in and replicate those voices. And um, so, yeah, so that's it. It was very simple. It was a simple process. Yeah. Was there at any point that you had to show that you could still do the voices? Because I know that Marty had to kind of almost prove to Warner Brothers that they could still pull off the voice that they did back in the <laughs> original show. That was me. It, it, Whatever. <clears throat> Marty, I mean, we're all older than we were when we first did it, so I suppose I wanted to be sure. Um, um, no, I, I, I don't actually, no, they didn't ask me to do that at all. They just said, come in and, and do it. I said, okay. So if I'd walked in and had laryngitis or sounded like I was, you know, I couldn't speak, then it would be an issue, but uh, it wasn't. And I probably would have told them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm terribly sorry, but I can't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's that's so cool. And I suppose you've mentioned that you reprise three of your previous characters. Um, now, at any point in you know scripting or conversations, were any of your other characters ever spoken about making a return, or was it always just those characters? That you those know? are the well, most well-known ones. Um, you know, some talk of snowman and but uh, cats and uh, La Quack. <clears throat> yeah, those were the, the most well-known, and the other a few other ones, Kate and Fox, a few times. But yeah, yeah. And there, some I, I you know what was crazy because I I did so many other voices for stuff. I'm not sure I've even seen them all. Yeah. When it got it season three or season four, I'm like I'm not I don't even remember. Isn't that terrible? Because <laughs> I I did two or three episodes of one character, but there were other little things. I'm like I'm, did I did I do that? I can't even remember. If I saw it, I'd be like I'm not that. <laughs> See, I'd I'd ask you of all the voices that you you know remember doing because there were so many of them. In if you'd been involved in the production, like of Courage and the scripting of which characters are going to return, is there any that you kind of had new ideas for, things you wanted to work on, something you enjoyed, or even if there were to be another series, if there was a character that you would like to voice again to either do something different or just because you really enjoyed it? I would love to. I would love to do a follow up to Freaky Fred because <laughs> I wanted to see. I wanted to know what that whole backstory was. And I wanted to know where that was going. Because you're given sort of, you know, the, the, the was a mental school for freaky barbers and he somehow escaped. But how did that happen? <laughs> and I just thought there was a lot more there to play with. And it was such a <clears throat> standalone uh, uh, show, that particular show. And so interesting, this guy was just freaked out about hair. I mean, it's just kind of mental. And I, and I, I thought there was more to play with with that. But I, mean, I think they might have been a little nervous about it because it was probably one of the more dark things that they did. I know they are because I think I saw somewhere on some animated uh, listing of the scariest characters um, on animation. It was right up there, like number six or seven or something oh, like that. 
that one episode. I was like, and I've listened to it. I'm like, yeah, that's creepy. That's just weird. <laughs> <laughs> kids are like, oh, mom, what's this about? And you're like, okay, you're a parent. And you have to explain that to your kid. And you don't even know what the hell is going on. <laughs> <laughs> is there any characters that say, if there were to be another series that you don't think we could see return? Say, for example, I know you kind of were mentioning that Dr. Vindaloo is perhaps a character that wouldn't be as wouldn't be received the same way perhaps currently is there any other characters that you think that we may, wouldn't be able to see for whatever reason no i don't think so i, I the, the vindaloo one maybe maybe not i don't know is there something about it that oh god it's such a <clears throat> tough time that we live in right because mm. i don't know the answer to that question I don't, if we did Vindaloo again, would people take offense to it? I mean, he's a doctor and he's absent-minded. And are, are you saying that Indian people who are doctors are absent-minded? I mean, I don't know. It's just, you're going to get flack for something. Mm. Um, I think that's just going to come with the territory that, that we now live in. The question is, are you portraying someone in a detrimental fashion? Um, I don't think any of the other characters were. I mean, I had the Cajun Fox, he was Southern, but that could be anywhere. Um, <clears throat> Katz is faux English. I don't, you know, <laughs> I, don't I, I don't think so. I, 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 I don't think I would, that would be offensive to many. Maybe, maybe, maybe but um, interesting question. Good question. Yeah. I don't have a good question. I think The Simpsons had some trouble with a poo for the same or similar reasons, but being an Indian myself, I love Dr. Vindaloo. Like, I wish that they were my dad. Dr. Vindaloo <laughs> is top tier Indian in my voice. What are you doing? You should be at school. Did you have breakfast? Come on. What are you? Get out of bed. Oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <Dr. Vindaloo. laughs> so, so. <laughs> Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> Off topic of that, yeah. In re in regards to the <laughs> Straight Out of Nowhere, uh, it's it's a Scooby Doo crossover. Mm -hmm. And um, prior to you hearing about the crossover mm -hmm. and getting cast and everything with it, were you a fan of Scooby Doo? Did you watch the movies or shows at all prior to that? And and if you did, did you have a favorite member of Mystery Inc? <laughs> I, I watched Scooby-Doo mostly when I was a kid. I hadn't watched it since. Um, but I remember all of it and all the same characters. Um, <clears throat> I, I think I had a, a crush on, on what's her name, the red-headed girl, when I was a kid, you know? I, I, what's her name? Daphne. Yeah. I was like, oh, my gosh. Yeah, I was, you know. Yes. <laughs> yes. I checked out. That makes sense. That's all I remember. <laughs> Just all. Okay. I remember because it was always kind of spooky and crazy and it was fun um but i hadn't seen it since i was a kid so to revisit mm -hmm. again i was like oh my god it looks it's very similar yeah. it de oh yeah it definitely makes sense to mesh them i don't know why they didn't prior you know what i mean They're almost the same thing you know what i mean yeah well somebody obviously looked at courage and go wait a minute this is dark stuff here we should marry these two and and didn't mm -hmm. see what the bastard child produces um <laughs> and that's, that's the movie that came out so uh yeah it made sense <laughs> so you you talked a bit about <laughs> you talked a bit about being in the studio with with um the voice actors on other shows and things with mm -hmm. with straight out of nowhere did you get to meet you know either before or during filming or even after did you meet any of the cast that you worked with um on the movie nary a one not okay. one not one i was in a studio in new york uh the producers were in a studio in florida and uh that's those are the only people i saw and i came back in to do some more patchwork they wanted to add some lines they wanted to change some things and which is normally what you do it was the same thing i was just talking to these people in florida so i could see them on a screen <clears throat> and sometimes they were showing you bits and pieces of the animation so you had an idea of what it was going to be but i never got to to work with uh with any any of the actual people um it's just the way it, it's the way it is, you know. It, it's such a funny world. Here, here's a funny story for you. Um, <clears throat> I got hired <clears throat> to do an, an announcer for CNN in, in the 2000s. They wanted a turn of the century program. And James Earl Jones, as you know, did the voice of this is CNN. So, you know, so, but they hired me to come in and do the, the thing for the, the, for this promo, for this show that we're going to do for the turn of the century. 
And so I'm doing it and I'm on the, in the studio with the headphones and I'm talking to these people in Atlanta. And they said, Paul, that's great. That's great. Um, can you do it again and sound a little more like James Earl Jones? And I went, uh, no, because nobody on the planet sounds like James Earl Jones. And secondly, doesn't he already work for you? <laughs> Why am I here? Yeah. <laughs> but it was such a funny thing. Can you sound more like James Earl Jones? I was like, <laughs> yeah, James Earl Jones. <laughs> I that I could, I would, but I, me and my voice is deep at the particular moment, and this is what you get. And so they went with it. But it was just like one of those ridiculous. They give you. They give you often ridiculous directions. <clears throat> so I went in for a, a car commercial once, and this is a total giveaway of the fact that they have no idea what they're looking for. And I went in and they said, um, <clears throat> Paul, that read was great. Now, what we want you to do, can you do it again and make it sound whimsical, ominous? And I went, square peg in a round hole? What are you talking about? Try doing whimsical, and ominous at the same time. You can't do it. It's just too, a collision of completely disparate ideas and you're going, they have no idea what they want. They have no idea. What. But you get these directions all the time and they're just hoping you're gonna walk in and, and give them what they want. And, and that's how it works 90% of the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a crazy world, it's a crazy world, you know? But yeah. give away that they're not sure what they're looking for and they're trying to give you direction to help you and it just is confusing you, so. And you just laugh and you go, okay, sure, whatever, okay. <laughs> <clears throat> I should have just done the cat, cats or something like that. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, I, I have, I have here. I don't know what this is, but um, behold, my esteemed colleagues in science, the world's first and only smart dehumidifier. <laughs> it could dehumidify the entire planet if needed. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, this thing worked only 19.63 minutes ago. Um, hmm, uh, oh, 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 I see the problem. Calibrations, calibrations. <laughs> well, that's funny. Um, this psychometer is way off. So that was, oh, <clears throat> that, was, was that was a character of the father who was a scientist. And that was one of the, I, ha I just pulled it up and I did <clears throat> about 13 different takes of various higher or lower, slower, faster, of, of um, I don't know if you can see that at all. It's just, no, it's all blank screen. But I, <laughs> I recorded all that. Okay, I was, I was in Saudi Arabia when they wanted me to send in all of that. I was doing some work there, and I they wanted me to give different recordings of this character. I hadn't been cast yet. This is for the pilot of of uh, Courage, and so I had to send in on my phone all these different recordings and they cast me out of that, which is normally weird because normally you have to have something akin to this or you know, an XLR microphone, which I have in the other room of my studio to get proper sound, but it just worked out that way. And life is, life is strange. That was amazing. <laughs> that, that was incredible. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. yeah, I have tons of stuff on here, but that's kind of silly. <laughs> Record, I mean, literally, so here you're talking about trying to find voices for stuff. So I, I, I use the phone often just to try to come up with ideas. Well, maybe I can, maybe I can do a voice like this and maybe that would work for something. Or, or maybe I could um, try to do it with this. Or... You're just playing around with different things. And I have all these recordings is just nonsensical rubbish that if somebody was listening to it going, this guy needs to be in a mental institution. Um, um, but that's what you do. That's what you do. You play, you come up with all these different things. And I, I had to come up with this one guy that I know that I work with, one of the writers for Courage, and he was doing Amazon bug diaries. He said, give me as many as you can. So I came up with like 15 different things. And they didn't pick one of them for this particular character. And I was like, well... <laughs> I don't know what else to do, <clears throat> but for other things that worked. And so they're that, they're that specific. And then when they hear it, they go, that's it. That's the voice we want. But it's it's completely subjective, to be honest with you. They just hear it and go, oh, that's what I want. But uh, it's, it's a strange process. It's just a really strange process. But I, I find, that <clears throat> find that the more you think about it, the more the less creative you become if you have an idea just just go with it and i forget that sometimes and i especially forget it during this pandemic and for the years prior because so much has changed but if you start trying to think about getting it right then you're 
absolutely on the wrong track because you have no idea what that is. So I, I have to, you know, remind myself, stop thinking so much, just have an idea and go with it. And that's usually when things are more likely to, to happen, but it's a hard trust process, you know, it's weird. That's right. And that's true for anything. It's like, you have to, I mean, I, I do a lot of auditioning for, I'm sure you know this, talking to other people, but for, for, for television stuff on this blue screen with a camera up here and you're talking to yourself or someone who's reading to you and you got to give it life and you work and you work and you work and, <clears throat> and then you're being too careful with it. At the end of the day, you just got to just kind of go. And sometimes the times that it works best is when you have that, I don't, I, I don't care. I'm just going to throw it away. If you've done the work and you go, fuck it, you know, excuse me. Um, and you just, whatever comes to mind, you do it, you know, and that's usually when stuff happens because you're not thinking too much about it. It's a weird balance, you know, and all creative stuff, whether it's animation or, or theater or movies, <clears throat> I heard this described one way by a famous director in England and it's true as hell, which is like, everything is a balance between what's worked out and what is spontaneous. So you do all this stuff and you try to get it on your head and understand it, but then you have to let this part go and try to be spontaneous and hope that, that what you've been, the practice that you've done will come out in some spontaneous way. You know, it's, that's, that's what it is. That's what it is. Even for animation. Crazy. I've got a quick question, actually, mm -hmm. really quick. Um, so when you're, after you like record all your stuff and when you're like watching yourself on like, like TV or like big screen, whatever, <laughs> do you feel like, awkward watching yourself back or are you like man i nailed that line or are they like oh why'd they use that line instead of the other one that other one was so good like just curious about that all of the above but mostly i like every actor and singer i know hate watching themselves hate listening to themselves uh, seriously there are some exceptions to that rule i'll tell you this my grandfather's grandfather was a very very famous opera singer amazing singer just like world famous and i was with him <clears throat> when listening to a recording of his some amazing opera it was unbelievable and you're sitting there going, oh god oh god jesus is awful awful and you're sitting there going what and so i have to say having recorded a lot of things singing and doing other stuff i said like oh fuck, I'm awful. I can't even. <laughs> and so i think we're just incredibly hard on ourselves about and you can't see yourself objectively. You can't because you have so many opinions about what you do, how you do it. It's, I mean, you could give an Oscar worthy performance and I guarantee you're sitting there going, oh God, it's God awful. What the hell are they looking at? You know, that's how most people that I know who do this nonsense, that's how they are. But that's kind of that, that perfectionist mentality that sometimes can be detrimental to you, but at the same time, it keeps you working and trying to, and very well-known people that I know, they I mean, hate everything they do, hate their auditions, hate their work. They look at it and they go, oh my God, what were they thinking? Why did they hire me? You know, that was just God awful, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> maybe that's why we're, artists stroll a little bit, you know, unstable at times because, you know, <laughs> loathe everything we do <laughs> when okay. you mentioned that i i am um, i constantly do like self-tapes for my acting coach and everything and you know i i've been fortunate enough that i with one of my self-tapes i sent i got a call back she made me watch it back and i was so much like i i could have done that better i should have done this instead of that and she was like it's it's fine rihanna and i was like, no and i used it as a way to pinpoint what I didn't like so I could work on it more mm. and do you find that you do that very similarly when you watch the final product and then you think oh maybe next time if I get the opportunity I could play around a bit more with this yes and that's that's good that's absolutely good but bear in mind that you can't it's so hard to be objective and that's why you do need someone who's a third party who is not you and has a really good eye like your acting coach hopefully to say you're being a little hard on yourself. This is not as bad as you think it is. And so, cause it's so hard to see ourselves objectively, really. So remember that, okay? So, so you're not too hard on yourself. I mean, you obviously keep working and keep getting better, but have somebody you trust that says, you know, Rihanna, that was 
nothing to worry about or that was just garbage and you need to do it again. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and take it either way. You know, sometimes you, you know that it, it could be better and sometimes you just have to hear that from people and get along with it. If, if it's someone you trust. And here's the other thing about that. One last thing about that. Only take what's useful to you. Because people are going to give you a lot of opinions and sometimes it's going to be way off the mark. Just whatever might be useful to you, take that, reject the rest of it. You have to be that strong about it and, uh, <laughs> to keep your sanity. <laughs> <laughs> I think all my sanity has already left this room. So no, <laughs> no, well, <laughs> keep your sense of humor. Keep your sense of humor. You have to. I mean, I, 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 uh, my, my, I, I'm all, when, when I feel like things are going badly is when I've lost my sense of humor because my humor keeps me playful it keeps me young and that child part of you always has to be a part of whatever you do and you want to protect that and so for me humor is a very important part of everything the right kind of humor just that you have a, an ability to laugh at whatever you do the ridiculousness of it while you're still working out real hard to you know make make it good um and learning to let things go you have to learn to let things go I and mean, it's very zen buddhist you know but it's true um because we're who we are as ours we're, we're, we're it's who we are we're bringing ourselves to something it's not like you write something and hand it in and you know something a little detached from you but it's you you walk into a room and 98 percent of the time you're going to be rejected right and i have this talk a lot with younger people and i guess i'm going off script a little bit here i'm sorry but um it's a lifetime gig to, have, to, 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 to float these two disparate things. One is you have this playful childlike joy. And at the same time, you have to develop a thick skin that you're not affected by rejection or as little as possible because it happens to everybody. Well, a few people it doesn't, and we're not one of them. But rejection is just a part of what it is. And it's per very personal because it's who we are, but you have to learn to, oh my God, that hurts, but let it go and move on. And that's a lifetime practice, I find. And at the end of the day, if you can master that or work with that, then you're going to be okay, you know, to me. <laughs> does it make sense? It does. Those are really important words that I think even in like everyday life, people should really strive to remember that because even if you just work a normal nine to five job you'll always get that criticism from your higher ups or things like that so I think that would really help anyone and everyone who's going to listen whether you're an actor or you're just someone who works a normal nine to five job, like no matter what it 100%, will help them 100 percent. I just say that because <clears throat> as actors and artists we tend to be rejected a lot and uh, it's a hard to take when you're sensitive and we are sensitive people and we like to create, but you want to protect that thing that's made you want to do it in the first place, yeah, right? Definitely. That, that joy, right? Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess going back on to Straight Out of Nowhere, once the movie came out, did you get a chance to watch it? Yeah. And if you did, what was your opinion on how the movie blended into the world with like Scooby and Courage merging together? I thought together? it worked really well. And I thought they got that, that, that crazy dance thing that they did at the end was just so, so kind of right. I'm, I laughed at that, especially when Eustace got up and started dancing. I was like, oh my God, I started laughing at that. And, but I thought the, the worlds melded pretty well together. You know, I really did. I really did. I don't know how it's, I think it's been received well. I mean, I've seen a, a lot of stars given to it. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't really pay attention to that, but it made sense. You could see that it made sense to, to join those two worlds. Yeah. I mean, I JB. agree. I mean, <laughs> it's just, I think it's absolutely phenomenal. But I guess if you were to almost change things, are there any aspects of Cats and the Quack that you wish were more prominent in the crossover? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I guess it would have been, well, I guess I wanted to keep it a surprise, you know, by the end, of course, you don't want to give it away, but I was I always like it when <clears throat> there's suggestions of things along the way that make you go, that's interesting. And I kind of wish there were little bits of things here and there where you were left to try to piece it together yourself, as opposed to just being a complete reveal at the very end of it, right? Somewhere Which along would have made way. sense with Scooby-Doo. Exactly. You see something you're like, wait a minute. What? Yeah, yeah. I didn't see any of that, and I would love to have seen some 
just snippets where they throw out things like they make you go, what? What was that? You know, and make you think. Because you're playing detective too when you're watching it, right? And that's part of the fun of it is you're trying to figure it out while you're watching them try to figure it out. And so <clears throat> with any good detective story and your little things here and there that aren't giving away too much, but enough to make you go, what? What was that? You know, that's the only thing that I would have liked to have seen differently. Or I guess. <laughs> <laughs> The final question that I have before we start to wrap this up is, are there any like different cartoons or series that you personally love that you'd love to see Courage crossover with next? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <clears throat> um, boy, that, that's a, I, I, I don't think I've entertained that question ever. I mean, <clears throat> maybe the other way you could go is just do something completely and utterly different than something horror, horror like but i'm trying to think of what that would be um i don't have a good answer for that i i, I you can make me think about it though you know what it's going to happen at like 12 o'clock tonight i'll go oh shit i should have thought of that that's what's gonna happen <laughs> i'm gonna call you or type you up and go, JB, I just have to that. but right now <laughs> i have no idea <laughs> so as jimmy said that was the last question i guess the only thing now is we want to quickly touch upon the future and that is do you have any upcoming projects that you can talk about or share at all well i have a couple of things that are brewing and i'm very close to but i'm superstitious so i <laughs> don't want to talk about i mean i am a little superstitious about that kind of thing a lot of people don't like to talk about them for whatever reason so um yeah but i'm gonna keep that one under wraps for the moment because um and you know to be honest with you um we've had two years of this pandemic and uh for a lot of people haven't had to work haven't had a chance to work for two years honestly right now i was just offered a reading of a new piece in the city this coming week and i turned it down I, I wanted to do it, but it was really not very good at all. And so I said, no, but I just not like, because I'm like so many people, so much wanting to go back to work and so much about that is working with other people and I miss it. Um, so it's all a little, uh, I've had two in-person auditions in the last uh, month. I've had other auditions online, I auditioned online, but actually in person. And it just was the weirdest experience. Just, just bizarre. After almost two years of being isolated, <laughs> being so used to Zoom and God love it, but it's not the same as being in a room with someone, you know, and the first time I was like, whoa, this is weird, but it's kind of cool. It's nice to be in front of people <laughs> and nerve wracking as well. Um, and I'm one of those people when I go into audition things, I kind of like things to go a little wrong because if you prepare too much you're trying to make it perfect but when things go wrong you have to think on your feet and sometimes you know you come up with ideas or you know you made a mistake and acknowledge your mistake and everybody knows you made a mistake and you laugh about it and it takes all the tension out of the room so things like that you just are different than having to audition on on the zoom and it's been a couple of them are just weird like really hard plays with very dark stories and you're online on zoom doing it like Devin I'm supposed to read with you in this scene the director's over here where JB and Millie are and there's another person down there watching you and I'm going do you want me to look in the in the camera or do you want me to look in the eyes of the person and they said, no, look in the eyes of the person that you're looking to on the screen. That's what I'm like, oh my God. It's... And you can't really, I can't really. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm getting from here <laughs> up, right? Yeah. So I'm just giving you an example of how <clears throat> challenging the environment is. And so it's starting to change now. And uh, yes, I'm close to some things. And so I'm just going to cross my fingers and hope that it goes well. Um, in the meanwhile, I love working with people and teaching with people, and I do as much of that as I can. So I do love working with people. As you can tell, I'm a goof head, and I like to play with people. <laughs> well, it's amazing to hear that there are some upcoming projects that you know people may hear about in the future. Is there somewhere where people can follow what the work that you're doing? Do you have any social media pages where you post about your work or anything like that? I, I I do I don't do a lot of social media. I just have a, an aversion to it for a lot of different reasons. I'm um, I go on Facebook every now and then, but I do have a website, 
It's paulsheffler.net, and I, I post stuff on there if some stuff comes up. Um, that's usually where I'll put it. But the social media thing, I'm, I have so many stories about social media that are, <laughs> that are right out of Black Mirror, okay? I mean, yeah, you guys are a rock of ages, right? I'm, I'm sure you saw that I do that, and that became a massive hit. And we had these fans who were groupies. And one day... This super fan comes up to me and she goes after the show. She goes, Paul, 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 can I talk to you? And I said, Yeah, what's up? She said, Um, I Facebook friended you about two weeks ago and you haven't friended me back. And I just want to know, is it me? And I went, Whoa, <laughs> oh. That's when I felt for the first time, it's like you're in this strange territory with people. Do you know what I mean? And so I said, and it was true. I said, look, I'm a peripheral Facebook user. I didn't see that. <clears throat> and I'm sorry I didn't, but do not take it personally. And so I've just learned to, and I've seen so many things on social media, and as we all know with Facebook and all the other stuff, I'm like, I've become more, I do use it, but I don't Instagram, I don't Twitter. I do do Facebook, but I'm very angry with them um, <clears throat> uh, for a lot of reasons that I'm sure we all know. And that's about as far as I go. But I don't post very often. I just like to keep up with my friends. So I've, uh, you know, it's been such a crazy four years, you know, with Trump and all this other stuff and the anger and the polarization and all the rest of it. And it's like, I do get involved with the things that I believe in, but I don't want to be sucked into that because it's just very, very difficult to navigate. And uh, so, so that's my long-winded answer to your, your question. My website's the best place to go. Well, that's amazing. <laughs> we'll, make, we'll make sure that we include the link to the website in the description Absolutely. below for anyone right, that right. would like to go and take a look at that and hopefully see what those projects are when they go on the website. Yeah, so thank you so much. Again, that will be in You're the welcome. description. And I guess also I want to take this time to point out that, of course, Devin is joining us today as a guest co-host. So I guess thank you so much for the time that you've also given us as well. Do you have anything that you would like to say or any social media that you'd like to shout out? Sure. I mean, I'm just happy to be here. I'm having like a fangirl moment, but I'm trying to keep it cool, you know, <laughs> hour or whatever. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. But no, um, for people that, know, you know, <laughs> people that don't know that, that are here seeing me for the first time, I am a miniature artist. So basically I make like really small, tiny versions of like everyday objects from like little whatever's to like full buildings, things like that. Um, and you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, whatever, all the, all the social media stu stuff. <laughs> Unlike Paul, uh, <laughs> awesome underscore underscore thanks. So I'm on everything. So you can find me there. Devin, my my daughter is going to find you on 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 online because she's does the kind of stuff that you do. She's 13 and she's just oh, okay. making stuff all the time. So I'll, I'll find her. In your Tell direction. her to find me on Instagram. That's the main one that I'm right. that I oh, well. focus on solely. So that's great, and we will put Devin's links in the description below as well for anybody who would like to follow this. So again, thank you so much um, for joining us, Paul. Like, I, I do oh, acknowledge I that you've been so generous with the time <laughs> that you've given us today. And honestly, when you were doing the voices, every single part of me, I'm like, do I be a professional or do I just start going, oh, yeah, <laughs> they're doing yeah, it. Clap. <laughs> and if you want to, if you, I mean, I know I'm a chatty Kathy, but I guess the, the takeaway for your next time is like, if you want a question answered, just like, yes or no. Um, and then you won't get like a 15 minute answer from me because I know we went over. I don't know, I'm sorry. I was having a good time with you guys. Oh, we had an amazing uh, yeah. time too. And yeah. like we say, thank you for just being so generous with the time because we do know that we went over. So we do appreciate that, you know, you stuck around for the end of the questions and everything. So thank you so much. So welcome. Thanks, okay. guys. Well, thank you so much to everyone for listening and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, guys.